Hello, welcome to another webinar. Um, this time we are doing a webinar on hemp uh, and hemp genetic seed sourcing, where it all comes from. Uh, I know in South Africa we've had a bit of a tough time the last two years in terms of making sure that this industry starts to move forward. Uh, we're not alone, it's a challenge globally at the moment, so we're going to unpack some of those nuances that uh, go into sourcing seeds, what kind of genetics you need, etc. Uh, we've got a whole panel of people coming on, and then we've got a chat to uh, First with um, a comrade of ours from uh, Argentina. But this uh, webinar is brought to you by Chiba Cannabis Academy and Friends of Hemp South Africa. Uh, Friends of Hemp South Africa is a non-profit organization set up to try and advance the hemp industry. So this session is about education. We will take questions at the end. There are no stupid questions. Well, there are some stupid questions. So don't ask a stupid question. But we'll answer all your questions if they make sense. Um, this is about learning, it's about sharing knowledge, there will be a recording afterwards which you can share with people who have not managed to make tonight because I still understand there's load shedding. I am coming from Spain right now, I'm in Valencia, there is no load shedding, it is quite a relief. There's good lighting and a good signal. So hopefully wherever you are, if you are uh, dealing with load shedding, um, hopefully you can follow this whole thing. If not, we'll send you the link afterwards. Right, let's get straight into things. I'm going to bring in our first guest. He is currently in Argentina, but it actually is based in Valencia. Uh, Maximiliano is his name. and. Uh, where are you, Maximiliano? Are you coming through? Hello. Can you hear us? You there? I think he's there. So if you can hear me. Yes. Hi, 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 Hi Trenton. Yes. How are you? Hi. I can hear you. I'm, I'm very good. Thank you so much for being here. I know you're currently in Argentina. So I'm very interested yes. to hear some of your opinions on genetics. Um, just because uh, you move between Spain and Argentina similar climatic conditions um, and you know especially if you look at Argentina it's a developing economy so a very very lots of parallels first of all can you just introduce yourself tell us about your company and what you actually do okay Trenton my name is Maximiliano uh, as you mentioned I'm living in Spain but now we have operations for the hemp industry in in Argentina Uruguay and Paraguay as you mentioned before, we share the same latitudes and same climate conditions. So I think that some of the learnings we are having right now here, we can we can translate and transfer to you. Uh, and I think it's uh, we because of the latitudes we have, we we are we have really promising. Uh, uh, hemp industry in our countries uh, so far what we are doing is validating uh, different varieties from all over the world especially european varieties we developed together with the, the university of buenos aires and the national institute of the seed uh, a node network in nine different locations uh, according not only because I, I think that the people that are hearing knows something about hemp and you know that logistic is a pretty sensitive thing with hemp so we 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 pick uh, the the locations not only because of the soil conditions and the weather and radiation but also the 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 proximity of different industries so you know that hemp works as a as a local cluster so we found on those places those nine locations cold press oil lines nearby and different uh, industries like chemical uh, cellulose uh, auto parts or textile that are nearby within the the 150 kilometers uh, around so um, so far the learnings are that uh, the european varieties especially the can i say names or varieties of course yeah or no yeah Yes, oh, God. Yes, okay. Need to learn. So, I just just before yeah. before you go there, is that this is some of the research that you are doing. You know, just to show the kind of scale okay, of, yes. of what you're doing. That's a uh, harvester, traditional one. That... And then these, so these are the trials yeah, you're that's doing. That's one yeah? of the nodes on the Buenos Aires province, southern Buenos Aires. So, did, did you have uh, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the locations, and then uh, we have a uh, nine eight more than that and, and in different provinces that's in buenos aires and so far the for example the, the performances of the polish uh, varieties they're public ones they're from the polish hemp program that they are yeah. from within the the ministry of agriculture they are performing uh, performing extremely well especially for for grains and dual purpose uh, so we can we can say and we can confirm that the our conditions in, in Argentina are pretty similar uh, to Europe from some countries. Sorry. Okay. 
How do you how do you how do you source? I mean, you're obviously going through a trial period now where you're trying. Can you to hear me? Places I can hear. Um, how do you decide where to source from? Is, is are you that early in the stage where you're just looking for what, whatever Fair you done. can get from wherever you can get to test out? Sorry, I'm hearing now. Uh, I just wanted to know how how you source your seeds. So do you just source them from all over the world and you're busy testing them? Is that the process you're in at the moment? We seem to be having some issues from Argentina. Let's just give them one more sec. Here's another clip of um, some of the stuff that they do. You can see it's uh, it's quite a serious operation. Obviously, everything mentored because they're testing different genetics. Uh, but it's exciting. And I think what we forget is that we can't just throw seeds in the ground and hope for the best. We've also got to make sure that, uh, that we do things uh, properly and test them. All right, let's see. I think you're back. You're back. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm having troubles with internet problems of the South Hemisphere. Yes, we, we know them. Um, I just want to know, what you, in terms of sourcing at the moment, so where are you? You're sourcing genetics from all over the world, and then you're trialing them. And how, how far down the, down the line are you with trials? Okay, so yes, we, we're trying, especially, as I mentioned, European ones, from Hempit, for example, from France, from the Polish Hemp Program, from, um, from Italy, from Asokanapa, from Hungarian varieties, Chinese ones, uh, also and and how far are we now we are starting to harvest we are harvesting so we are uh, gathering all the information from the lab so we we don't have, we are not yet quite yet with the all the information but what I, we can see as you see on the videos in the photos that we can see that the performance for dual purpose are really good you you have seen the, the yellow one that is uh, french is performing very well even better than in in france we were in France in the on their uh, before harvesting, and so it's very promising. And we are discussing with them about this. So the yields are good, but not only the yields. We are waiting for the the nutritional properties of the grains. For example, we are evaluating that with the with the cold press soil companies in Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay. So we are uh, getting all the information, not only the yields, but also the quality of the grains and the fibers and for specific um, uses of the specific applications for different industries. So I think that's the the key, I mean, the, the most important thing, because as you, you may know, the, the bottleneck of the industry is not on the field. I mean, countries like yours or, or ours, I mean, the, the, mm. the, the hectares, the amount of, of cool, uh, plantal uh, hectares that we have is and enormous. Yeah. And, and mm. what we are expecting is the pool of the demand. I mean, that's the, the bottleneck. And that's yeah. why we need to standardize different products for, for the application of yeah. uh, hemp derivatives. Well, I guess it's processing is still a challenge for you as well, because that's obviously a, a global issue at the moment, is especially if you want to do fiber, is actually decortication machines, etc. Um, you, you, you have a subsistence farming community in Argentina. Is there an effort at the moment to bring in rural farmers? You talked about these nodes. Um, are they kind of nodes that include the, the, the local farmers? Yeah, and, th and that's Trenton is the most risky thing because all the farmers, all the farmers are on board. I mean, all of them wants to try uh, hemp, and that's a problem because yeah. if I mean, don't ask me why. I don't know the the, the 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 logic of this, but all of them wants to try and to 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 sow. But the problem is that they they don't they don't put yet that on the market. I mean, they don't have the demand, and they want to do mm. and do that anyways. And even without trialing different varieties. So the problem is that if we start doing that, like, I mean, for us, I mean, people want to start uh, sowing like a, a thousand hectares. It make no sense. And they, mm. they won't have the best yields ever. And the problem is that uh, among them start uh, discussing that. I mean, no, maybe hemp doesn't have the, the best yields. And, and if they start having a bad experience, I mean, it's like a, like a, a user from any app. Like if they have a bad experience, they won't yeah, be trying again. I mean, so that's a problem. And that's why we are pretty, we are pretty clear on that. And, and luckily we have on board the, you know, in Argentina, around 90% of our, of our uh, agriculture is a uh, no-till. So it's direct sowing. Okay. So we are not okay. tillage system in Argentina. And that's a, a bit complicated for him because you have all the soil when you, you leave all the, the biomass on the soil. Uh, you cover and that, that, that has a lot of uh, benefits because you keep the humidity on the soil, you keep the, all the, 
the, the bacteria they're living, but the problem is that the soil is pretty compressed. And that's a problem for, for uh, hemp roots to grow uh, direct straight uh, down. And that's uh, a big problem, but that, I mean, it's not a main obstacle because you can try and, and analyze and you can find uh, less compressed soils. So that's yeah. not an issue uh, actually. But uh, the, the importance is that we have the, the main association that, that aggrupates all the, the, the farmers, most of the farmers in Argentina, that they are bringing on board to, the, to our project, to our company, uh, and they are helping with the diffusion of this, uh, of this crop. So that's a, that's a good si signal. But uh, the thing is that is to control the, the farmers and not start, let them try uh, hundreds and hundreds of hectares that that's easy to achieve mm -hmm. in Argentina because yeah. I think that the the yes the worst part of that it's uh, is pretty sensitive yeah so final question um in terms of farmers sourcing seeds in Argentina is that a challenge or are, are they relatively easy to get hold of no no it's relatively easy I mean you have a, a political issue in Argentina that you have a um, uh, I mean, some restriction for importations because they want to develop the, the local, the national industry. But you have a, a lot of people that because the law is new in Argentina last year, they, they approved hemp and cannabis, but they are regulating the law. And, and there's a lot of people pushing from, from uh, forbidding the, the foreign varieties and develop our local markets. But they don't realize that we don't, ha we don't have yet land races. And if we wait for developed land races, we will lose a huge opportunity uh, because, you know, in Argentina, we have a giant neighbor that is sleep right now, that is Brazil. Mm. They, don't, they yeah. didn't legalize yet and they have an enormous market, but they have tropical weather. And so we have some time to until they legalize and then they adapt uh, varieties for tropical mm. weather. And we have this opportunity and the government is understanding that. And they start letting us to register foreign varieties to start doing breeding locally with the owners of the germplasm. So that's a, that was a really tricky situation and really stressful. But luckily, we could uh, share with them the, the opportunity that we have as a country. And they are open to, to do that, right? To start uh, taking advantage of, of the varieties from abroad and the most developed uh, varieties. I think I lost you, Trenton. Are we back? I think we're back. I'm still here, man. Yeah, sorry. sorry. No, we're, back. We're, back. we're back. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, my, my internet completely dropped out. How bizarre. Max, we've come to the end of the time. So listen, I really, really appreciate your insights. Um, we're, we're obviously very open to working with countries, especially I'm sure you've learned a lot of the knowledge that we could, we could learn from. So I look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thank you for your time and enjoy your trip to Argentina. I'll see you next time in Valencia. Thanks to you, Trenton. Thanks. See you. See you soon. Oh, thanks. Great, that was Maximiliano um, growing hemp uh, in Argentina at the moment, testing it all out, uh, also based in Spain. So some good connectivity there and some good opportunities to, uh, to share information, which is what this is all about. This plant is trying to come online. It's brand new, you know, we're still learning as we go along. Uh, it comes from a prohibition space, uh, ridiculously, but that's the way it was. So it's important we share knowledge as much as possible. Let's not forget that hemp has amazing, amazing, amazing potential to really change a lot of things on this planet from a sustainability perspective. So we need to bring it, bring it online as quickly as possible. Right, let's bring everyone else into the room. Linda, if you can just bring everyone in. Nati, no stranger to hemp webinars, welcome. Uh, we have uh, Quena from the ARC and Seely. I'm gonna let you introduce yourselves and Ayanda, so we can just quickly go around the room and start with you, Nati, if you can just do a quick introduction, please. Yeah, how's it? Thank you, Trenton. Thank you for this platform. Um, I come from a, from a farming background and ornamental horticulture. I've, I've been doing that for m the biggest part of my life and, and, and being growing cannabis at home for 
basically the same time and then just basically shifted my ornamental horticultural experience into cannabis um, big time and then him came along um at first as a as a as for me a, a social response to some of the the projects that i was busy with and then um, i realized that the plant likes me um and um and I've been growing it ever since and, and really playing with, with the genetics and what we can find in South Africa at the moment. Really having, right, having right. a lot of fun with it, John. Right. Really having a lot of yeah. fun with him, really. I know you're also doing a lot of trials, like some of the pictures we saw yes. um, from Maximiliano, which is so, so necessary. So thanks for all the work that you're yeah. doing. Um, Tzili? Thanks, Trenton. Um, so it's TD, Chiva. So in Sasuta, the L-I is a D. Ah, <laughs> so I always... Ah, there we go. That out of the Thank you. Um, so I'm a practicing lawyer based in Maseru Lesotho, although I did most of my legal studies in South Africa. Um, I've been working in the commercial legal cannabis industry since 2016. At the time, Lesotho was the only African country embarked on this journey. Um, so I've been working with that in, in that environment um, as a legal advisor, compliance manager, um, and legislative drafter. So um, I just really liked Nati's comment about how the plant likes me. So I think I'm pretty much in the same position. The plant has led me to Vienna currently, where we are attending the UNCND and listening to very interesting conversations around regulation of the plant. So I hope to come back with good feedback. All right. I know you're there with Fields of Green for All as well. We're doing some presenting. So good luck there with a real sort of global uh, audience today. Vienna. Valencia, Argentina, and Johannesburg, and West Cape. So, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Quena from the ARC, which is the Agricultural Research Council. Can you just quickly tell us who you are and what you guys do, for those who don't know? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Trenton. And uh, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come and uh, share what uh, we are doing uh, in terms of uh, the hemp cultivation in the country. Yeah, uh, as we mentioned, I'm from the Agricultural Research Council and the ARC have been involved with the HEM research uh, for the past 25 years. And uh, yeah, I've been involved uh, with the uh, uh, research projects at ARC uh, since 2007. That means it is the past 15 years that I've been involved in the uh, HEM research. Uh, thank you. Great. Thanks for being here, Kwana. Uh, Ayanda, no stranger to hemp. Hey, Trenton. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very lovely to be here. And, and it's really great to have our panelists and all of the guests who have tuned in. I'm Ayanda Bam. I'm the president of Friends of Hemp South Africa. I wear a number of different hats uh, in the industry. I've been around for about 10 years, uh, working across four continents. And I am particularly passionate about the importance of seeds um, as it relates to kickstarting the industry but also as a tool to be able to empower, I think, uh, our local heritage uh, and some of the amazing resources we've already been endowed with uh, in South Africa, particularly. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Trenton. Great. I think, I think I'm going to start with you, Ayanda, and just uh, you know, the, appreciate there are all different kinds of levels of people on this, uh, on this uh, webinar. So you know, what, what, what is a hemp genetic and why is it important? What is the definition of a hemp genetic? You could maybe start with that, Ayanda. So I think maybe the, the uh, and I'm not an agronomist, so maybe Nati is probably the the better person to answer this. But I mean, effectively, what we're what we're talking about here is not really a distinction between sort of what is what is hemp and cannabis. So just importantly, that basically we're talking about the same things. It's sort of mm. if you imagined that um, all of us who are on this call, who are of different shapes and sizes, are all of the Homo sapiens species, um, but we all look. Uh, different, we sound different, uh, we have different kinds of features, both that you see and, and others that you don't necessarily see. And so genetics uh, and the varietals and cultivars are effectively those things where you have cannabis for different types of end uses. So some um, uh, uh, cultivars of varieties of cannabis um, are bred to be very, very rich uh, in fiber because they're used for those particular end uh, applications. Uh, whereas either other might be very useful for grain, for example, uh, and give you lots of seeds. So what you have is basically quite a quite a variety uh, when it comes to hemp, and it's always very important to match the cultivar to and end use uh, because that's effectively the the kind of characteristics that 
uh, that kind of species is endowed with. So you're looking to sort of maximize those things, obviously, for your output markets. Um, so that's a very sort of non-scientific way of explaining what what a cultivar is. Um, well, but hopefully well, it's helpful to, to some of those uh, of us who don't come from that scientific background. We'll get some science from uh, Nati and, I, and I've got a section where we're going to actually unpack, um, you know, the, the uses, uh, because essentially it's, it's very important that uh, the output is, is, you know, determines the input. Um, Nati, you've been dealing with seeds for many, many years. What, what, what's your kind of definition of a hemp genetic? Why is it important? Um, Trenton, uh, I can't give you a scientific answer for this because there's no science in this definition at all. Um, the definition at the moment is um, there by prohibition. So we've got, a, we've got a limit of an active substance in a plant determining now the genetic of the plant. So if the plant stays below 0.2% THC in South Africa at the moment, um, mm. it is still hemp. And the moment it goes above that, it's either medicinal or just dacha. And it's, it's, it's been governed by different laws. So, so that is a problem. So we found, obviously, all over the world that this prohibition of him has forced the genetics in certain directions where people were forced to breed in this low THC genetics. But it was often detrimental to the other properties of the plant. And we found, I mean, that, that um, yeah, I mean, that, that really we, we find better qualities in the plants where we find some higher THC too. Better pest resistance, better growth, bigger. Um, maybe it is also because of our latitude, which is completely different. But we find much better results out of our land race genetics, for instance, where we cannot apply that, that, that definition. I cannot in South Africa even call it hemp because it is above that 0.2% level. The moment I test mm. it a few weeks into flower, early in flower, like we're supposed to test uh, at the moment, 15 days after flower, I do hit those low levels. because So then it is still hemp by definition. But there is really no botanical science in that definition. Um. Yeah. Okay. Let's um, let's uh, uh, just just briefly, and then we'll go on to the other panelists. But um, we've obviously had a bit of a crisis in South Africa in terms of getting seed in. Um, what is what is the current status at the moment, in your view, in terms of getting seed in for this season? We missed pretty much missed last season, you know. Yeah, Trenton, we we we're hoping on those deals to come through this year. I, I see a lot of people are advertising, they, they're talking about earlier seed import, but it is a big, big risk for any entrepreneur to step into that space now and pay out of his own pocket or with investment money and import 15 tons of seed. So oh. it will once again rely on the pre-orders from the farmers and, and their uptake um, of this opportunity to purchase seed from, from people that are taking the chance. Um, and that is what happened last season, that we just couldn't get the pre-orders together for these companies so that they can order in time. And then if you, if you end up with a small order, also the overseas companies are not really interested in providing all the phytosanitary certification that's needed um, for South African market. And there is a bit of a tit-for-tat going between South Africa and Europe at the moment because of the, the false cotling mart um, um, regulations on, on citrus now and our South Africa South Africa is also playing a bit hardball on it. So yeah, there's there's some strict requirements that are normal. I mean any any person that imports seed into the country deals with that. It's just that the hemp mm. industry is new and our suppliers are not used for to testing for all these pathogens that we sit with. Yeah, so a lot of hope. We hope it's gonna work. More people are gonna get seed this season. Um I would like an update from Quena where we're at with the with the ARC seed and when we can expect any any multiplication of that to some some degree because that's really what we're excited about is those two varieties that were bred in South Africa mm. and then um, um, yeah maybe uh, accessing the 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 opportunity to further <coughs> and bring it in with what we what we've got at the moment because we've also moved on quite a bit since those uh, two varieties were developed if I'm not mistaken yeah. Yeah, well, that's a perfect opportunity. Um, Quena, so, you know, you, you, I'm sure you're acutely aware of the seed challenges we've had. Um, and one of the challenges, I think, that's been uh, exacerbated by the sort of lack of supply, uh, especially with the sort of rural, smaller farmers, you know, who don't necessarily have the capital to put up front uh, for, for, for large seed volumes, that are also still figuring this out on the ground. Where, where, what is the status with hemp one and hemp two? Is there any chance of them getting into the marketplace anytime soon? And what would your advice be to, to, to the industry from, from an ARC perspective in terms of how we can uh, smoothen the process to get things out? Okay, thank, thank, thanks, Trenton. Uh, maybe just going straight to the point. Uh, at the moment, SA1 and SA2 
are not yet registered. Uh, we have submitted the uh, documentation for the registration of those cultivars. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we are still we are still waiting with the hope that uh, everything will be finalized before uh, the beginning of the growing season. And uh, by the way, even if the completion of the registration is completed by now, we won't be able to supply the farmers with the seed because we still have to do the the, the seed multiplication so that we have yeah. enough quantity of seed to be able to supply the farmers. And one other thing, one other important thing that I also need to mention is that uh, the, the two varieties that were mentioning, uh, they were developed and were tested under certain conditions, but they were never tested under other climatic conditions. For example, in Limpopo, Mpumalanga, Gauteng, for example. So because of funding, uh, we couldn't test them under those, those conditions, but we, we can assure the farmers that these two cultivars can do very well, even better than the imported cultivars under the conditions of the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape, and also part of KZA. Uh, the Department of Agriculture just came in, like what ARC is currently doing. Uh, uh, they, they, they come in uh, with the, with the uh, a funding that uh, we are currently doing, we are, we are testing, uh, those uh, cultivars under uh, uh, houting at the moment, under houting conditions, uh, with, the, with the aim of testing them under all conditions in, uh, in all provinces. And we are not only going to test only SAM2 and 1, but also other cultivars that we have in our gene bank, because we might find that we, there are cultivars in our gene bank that can even do better than SA1 and SA2, because we don't know. We have never tested in those uh, kind of conditions. So that's what uh, ARC is currently doing with the funding that uh, uh, we got from DALRAT, of which we, we, we wish that we would have uh, gotten this funding earlier uh, than uh, now. Uh, thank you. Well, that's, that's, that sounds very encouraging that at least it's moving forward. I mean, I think one of the, the fears that we have, you know, is that, you know, we, if, we, if, we, if we become an import market for seeds, then essentially we are exporting capital all the time, which is, I know that, the, the, you know, there's the, I like to call them the seed, the seed mafia, you know, have a lot, are starting to lock things down in certain African countries and in Tanzania recently. They passed a law that if you are caught uh, sort of secondary seed trading for you know vegetable fruit seeds, um, that you can uh, get up to 12 years in prison or a 220 thousand dollar fine, which is completely insane considering it's a market where seeds have been traded openly for many years. So I think that the, one of the keys to the success of our industry is making sure that we do have control over genetics and we are able to multiply seeds locally and we are able to uh, to create genetics or, or seeds that work you know for our environment. Um, let's see, the, you, 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 you stay in uh, Lesotho, it's a, a completely different market, I know that the THC market has been heavily driven out of that space, but there has been a lot of talk recently about hemp becoming a potentially viable crop in Lesotho, um, can you unpack some of the challenges you might be having getting seeds and genetics, uh, is it an issue? Thanks Trenton. So currently, uh, again, maybe to Nati's earlier point, the challenge is really around the definition because also in our law in Lesotho, it's, our legislation just refers to it as cannabis. Therefore, there's no distinction with regards to hemp. There's no distinction with CBD products. So that has also led to quite uh, a complicated structure in the sense that there are some clients that I serve that their licenses do also permit them to engage in the hemp industry, although the licenses are still then typically issued by the Ministry of Health. So they've obviously been a lot of debates around whether or not then legislation should be reformed so that it is separated, so that the Ministry of Health deals with the health aspects. And then we have the Ministry of Agriculture to deal with hemp and agriculture, which is, which is probably more appropriate when we're talking about hemp. However, to my knowledge, that has not advanced further than those discussions at this point. So in my mind and in my experience, I found that that complicates things a lot for operators that may be looking to do something completely different in the industry when they're dealing with substances that are not psychoactive at all. So those are the challenges that we currently face where you find that maybe clients that are trying to buy in seeds from abroad, they are required to get all sorts of permits and, clear, and, clear, and clearing documents from the European market that is supplying the seeds to Lesotho. 
Um, whereas for the European entities, because it's classified as hemp, they can freely trade it among themselves. Oh. So it really le leads to a lot of um, administrative work and a lot of bureaucracy, which is unfortunate. So we're hoping that there will be some amendment soon relating to the definition. And um, we also look to South Africa quite enviably with regards to how advanced the laws are relating to plants, um, whether we're talking about plant um, improvement laws or plant breeder plant <laughs> plant breeders rights um i think those have also at least set up the landscape to protect whether to protect the smallholder farmers the indigenous growers it's just that i think um we just need better support from our respective governments in getting those people to also participate and understand how they can use those mechanisms and that legal framework that is currently available to their advantage because those protections do exist However, I think it's not clear to a lot of people how to access them and how to make use of them in a commercial sense. Yeah, great. Let's, let's just talk about sourcing. I mean, I know, I know you, you're very involved in other African countries and African Union and stuff, but let's just uh, quickly unpack sourcing. So when, when you are looking for seeds in Lesotho or any other countries you might be aware of in, in Africa, uh, what, what are the mm -hmm. countries at the moment? You know, we, we, our, our, our guest earlier from Argentina said that the Polish variety seems to be growing quite well. Uh, what, are, in your experience, mm -hmm. are some of the other sources of seeds that, that uh, we are, as Africans, trying to deal with at the moment? Um, I'm maybe not familiar with the specific names, but I do, according to my records, I've seen there are a lot of demand from to get seeds from the Netherlands. Um, it's usually maybe the Netherlands and Switzerland. Those are the ones that I've seen more frequently. Okay. Okay, great. Nati, I know you've been kind of in that space as well. Do you want to give us a bit of insight into, I know you're, you're testing all kinds of different varieties. Where, where are they coming from? Yeah, so, so we've, been, we've been fortunate to also get some of those Polish varieties. We, we've tested three of them. I did not have very good results, but, but you guys must know I'm in the Western Cape. It is completely different. We're in a, in a winter rainfall area. We're not really in a, in a hemp growing area. We have to irrigate. So you do get completely different results than you would in a dry land setting or in a, in a well, where you would have summer rainfall. So um, we had mixed success with that. Um, I don't like the monaceous pollen around um, because um, just out of respect for all the THC growers around me, the home growers that they've got a right to grow. So I don't think those monaceous um, varieties should be grown close to um, sort of urban areas or where there's any other growing around because it is quite specialized breeding that went into that. And we don't know what that could do sort of down the line if that pollen spreads too much. And they're really pollen bombs because they, they're basically um, bisexual or, or they carry both sexes. Um, my, my biggest, um, I mean, our best um, results come from tropical, subtropical varieties out of China, Vietnam. Um, that's really where we get the, the biggest biomass, our seed. Um, I've now started to get some seed out of China. We've got Yuma and Puma that I'm exciting to trial. It looks very similar to, that, to what I've been working with. We've got a strain from Vietnam, for instance, that's very exciting because um, I've planted that in July last year and it did not flower until now. So we got out of winter at like way under 12 hours um, light. We kept that plant in vegetative state right through the season. So we've got massive plants right out of winter. So there were four months where it got winter rain where we didn't have to irrigate. And interesting enough, the only other plant that shows exactly that same trait is land ray seed that I brought from Imponda land last year in June. And I exactly. trailed them right next to each other. Um, I also um, had Professor Deploy there a few weeks ago, and he was also very excited about those traits that we're finding there. But then when you flower them out, you are going to find higher THC in them than what is legal at the moment. But that, So that's the kind of thing that excites me. Into the future, we, we would really like to, in the Western Cape, get our, get our winter varieties in a shorter period, time period, so that it can be um, incorporated in, into our canola and winter wheat farming setups, so you have another rotation opportunity for them. Um, so that's, that's sort of what we're leading to. I'm, I'm really focused on food. <laughs> Especially in the Western Cape, where I don't see us as a, as a big biomass producer of him. So, yeah, there's, there's some exciting things happening. And in fodder, too. I think that's also for the Western Cape a big opportunity for under irrigation to grow it as, as fodder. Because we have some areas where people are doing that quite effectively for, the, for instance, the dairy industry. Years away. As I've heard you uh, you know, uh, say many times, you know, cannabis is like advanced botany. 
you know, it's on yes. steroids. It's not, it's not just throwing seeds in the ground, hoping for the best. I mean, if you actually look at the products that you can make, it completely is yeah. mind bending that this can come from one, one plant, you know, um, I, under the, the, you know, the, there is an argument here and I, and I've heard it on good authority, but don't quote me that, uh, the THC level will go up. I think I've heard 2%, um, you know, 3%, but apparently it will go up, which will help us a lot. Um, because for those of you who don't know, if you are growing a crop, and uh, our UV rays have an impact on a lot of international genetics and basically take the THC level over what is legally allowed. So then you essentially end up with a hot crop, which means you're, you go from a farmer to a criminal overnight. Um, there is an argument around um, growing cannabis as cannabis. If it is high THC, you remove the flowers and that goes one way, the seeds and, the, the, and everything else goes the other way. Um, but how much knowledge do you have about some of the strains in Ponder land? I've heard some, some feedback from some people that, you know, a lot, a lot of the land race strains there actually could be quite good for hemp applications. Um, what's your sort of lens on that? Um, so on the THC thing, um, it sounds like there will be some exemption uh, on THC levels uh, around the sort of the 1% uh, level. The current version of the private purposes bill. So that's out of the Department of Justice um, actually had as one of their options sort of one or 2%. Um, I think there's, there is certainly an argument to be made that uh, the rest of the biomass that comes from uh, Landry's Dacha actually is, is hemp. Um, right. and, and that can actually have various kinds of applications. Now I'm not suggesting that that, you know, those kinds of cultivars are particularly great for you know, um, clothing and apparel types of textiles um, because they tend to be like much shorter staples. Um, and, you know, if you don't need to like do very much degumming, you can actually use them for various sort of biocomposite applications um, for construction and other things. So um, I think I think there is there's certainly quite a bit of a discussion to be had um, around sort of how you classify the plant. And I think we've gotten ourselves into a little bit of a definitional uh, quagmire um, just as it as it relates um, to him, but I think the, the the fundamental challenge actually when it comes to you know with sourcing because there are lots of supply challenges. I mean, let's we, we need to be um, quite clear with ourselves that the shortage that um, of of seeds is not just a South African issue mm. um, because of course of the prohibition that we've had over decades. Um, as Nati was talking about, there was also not an investment in, in the multiplication of seeds. So we don't have like these large stocks of seeds, even if they are sitting in other markets. So it's going to take a while um, to be able to access those. But once you are able to access those, whether from China or for some, from somewhere else, the fundamental challenge in South Africa is that the seeds themselves are actually still illegal um, under the Drugs Act, which criminalizes the whole plant. So um, you can imagine if you bringing hemp seeds in um, and you having to convince a customs official who has no way of being able to distinguish like between a hemp or a cannabis seed that actually you have the right to do. Um, yeah. So we've had a number of challenges um, around there. Um, but I think the, the, the big, big, big thing in South Africa, once you actually are able to get stuff here is to really think about the, the large scale adaptation that we we need to be doing here. So it's not, you're not just planting a tomato and you're going to get a certain result. We have so many different agri-climatic zones in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So you can't just sort of plant a seed that comes from some other place and expect that it's going to perform in the same way. It really doesn't. And so it's important to actually warn those folks who do have permits and are looking to grow, you know, what we always say from um, friends of hemp, you'll know Trenton is, start with a list of varieties that actually have been adapted here and they're a list some of them are um, on, the, on the polish variety but maybe look at also some other seeds um that are because i think traditionally we've been sourcing from the eu and their registry basically is not around actually a statutory limitation um the 0 0.2 thing actually each member state can decide on a level of thc that they want this just allows them to be able to access some of the subsidies that come under the common agricultural policy. So it's got nothing to actually do with um, with regulations. I think we should be able to look at a wider variety um, of like seeds, particularly as Nati's saying in subtropical areas, um, lots of varietals that are grown specifically for our latitudes and looking at where 
Some of these maybe have been trialed in other regions, but adaptation is really critical. And then we need large scale multiplication across the whole globe. It takes a long time to be able to um, get seeds to market. So you kind of need to start um, quite early, you know? I mean, even when uh, he's talking mm -hmm. about seeds from the ARC, um, it's going to still be a long time before, before we get that. So we have a sourcing challenge on a number of different fronts. So we need to be able to think about what are we doing locally to think about sort of the local breeding? What are we doing with adaptation? What are we doing on the legal side to make sure that it's much easier to get the stuff in? So it's a bit of a, a, a complex challenge around how we, we get over the sourcing uh, issue. Mm. Thanks, thanks for that, Diana. Um, Quena, the, you know, the, 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 there's obviously a lot of work that's been done by the ARC. You know, very important work that uh, we need to, you know, sort of use to, uh, to uh, in an advantageous way to push our industry forward. Um, I guess the the challenge that we have at the moment is apart from genetics, just to digress slightly, because we I want to talk about, um, you know, what you what you ultimately put in, you get out in terms of, uh, you know, your output is determined by your inputs. Um, and, and one of the challenges we have here is, you know, industrialization. Uh, how, how up to speed is the ARC with the, 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 the kind of products that can be made from, from hemp um, and, and, uh, and, and matching that with the identification of specific genetics? Uh, honestly speaking, uh, uh, Trinton, uh, with, uh, with 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 ARC, we 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 only uh, looked at the, the the cultivation of the of, of of a hemp. So, with regard to the product development, that was the project that was run by CSIR. So, I I know that they, we, we know about the products that one can make out of a hemp plant, but we have never made those product ourselves. Like I said. Most of the work that we did was only on the cultivation and the development of the cultivars. Yeah. Is is that information freely available, or is it under lock and key at the moment? The, you mean with the, with regard to the research that we did? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, some 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 it is available for for for, for example uh, the, the the production guideline that uh, ARC has has developed. With regard to the cultivation, it is available. But with regard to other information, those are the information that we we we, have said, well, we are going to use as part of the registration process. So it might not be available now, but after the registration, obviously we'll have to share all that kind of information so that people will know how SA1 and SA2 is like or how they will perform in comparison with the other cultivars. And I'm assuming that you, you also tested international cultivars over a period of time, because what will obviously be quite useful is, is if that information could be made available. Because at the moment, you know, people like Nati are busy doing trials. But if, if you know, I think one of the most important things in this industry is to bring it online as quickly as possible for our economy, okay. et cetera, et cetera. It, 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 did you do other cultivars, and do you think there's any possibility of that information being made available? Le, le, maybe in brief, in brief, uh, 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 of what ARC has done in terms of research. Uh, as we all know, there are no registered cultivars in the country. Uh, when the research started, so we imported different cultivars from different countries across the world. Uh, this include uh, France, uh, Hungary, some in Argentina, Poland, just to mention a few. And then we tested them. Like I'm saying, because of funding, we couldn't test those cultivars in other provinces. We looked at uh, the provinces where they will give you a day length that is required by uh, a hemp uh, plant, which was the coastal region of South Africa. That's when the, our main system was focused on. And uh, out of the adaptability trials that we did, there were cultivars that were recommended to, that they can do well under our conditions. And uh, there were three that mentioned, uh, there were uh, Futura 77 is one of them, and uh, Compoldi and then Novadaska. Those are the three cultivars that were said to can do well under our conditions. And then the aim then became to develop the cultivars that can perform better than the three that I've, I've just mentioned. That's when we started with a, a program of developing those cultivars, SA1 and SA2. And of course, they were compared against those three that I said uh, after testing, we said these are the recommended cultivars. And uh, SA1 and SA2 always performed better than those three that I've mentioned. As I, as, as, as I said earlier, uh, the, the test was only done in those kind of climatic conditions. So we don't know how SA1 and SA2 will perform in other provinces where they were never tested. 
Have you identified what those two particular cultivars uh, might be good for? Are they good for fiber, grain, or has it not gone that far yet? They were developed specifically for fiber production, not, not for seed, but for fiber production. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, CD, uh, you know, this is obviously quite a, a minefield with all kinds of different sort of angles. Um, you know, and, and I just, I'm not to hone in on the sutu just because you're from there. I know you, you have a very wide lens. But what, what are your opinions in terms of, um, are there particular um, outputs that we should be focused on in, in South Africa? Should we be focused on fiber? Should we be focused on, you know, um, bioplastics at some point? Uh, where do you think we are in terms of the value chain? And do you think there's, firstly, do you think there's a local market for certain products? And, and do you think there's an exportable international market for the mm. more kind of uh, mid to high tech level uh, items? Thanks, Trenton. I think currently what we are also experiencing in Lesotho is really the questions around the development of the local market, because currently the emphasis has always been on exporting, which again, that has its own challenges. And because the industry, cannabis and hemp is ever changing and always developing, that becomes quite a headache for operators to keep up with. So we are also exploring the prospects of expanding the local um, industry. And ideally that would then also include um, the development of local finished products. So whether that is medicines, whether it is animal feed, bioplastics, and so on. Um, I think currently the discussions right now are really still quite broad. And um, I've also looked to some of the feasibility studies from South Africa, which date back to the 90s for guidance, because I think those are valuable studies that um, really speak to a lot of um, countries specifically. And um, currently, I can't say which products we should be going towards. However, I think the emphasis really at this point is the development of local markets and the production of um, final products rather than us always exporting um, just the raw material to be further processed elsewhere. So that is really where I think the conversation is at the moment. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. Um, I've got there's a few questions that have come through. Um, the first question is, uh, which I'll probably direct towards you, Nati, is how do you tell if a seed is good quality? Can you tell by looking at it, essentially? Um, that's, from, that's from sort of Michael in uh, the trans guy, actually. Yeah, Trenton. Yeah, you, you you're looking for a, for obviously there's some there's some guidelines. You want the want the seed fully developed, and for that you can look. You need a dark seed um, on which the markings are properly developed. Um, the best test is a press test. If you've got to do it by hand, you just press the seed, and a weak seed will just it will, it will just fold in your hand. And that's basically what what some of the seed testing equipment also does. They, they just use um, air pressure or or laser to do that to just test the seed. Um, as a pressure test, but it's an intuitive thing. I mean, I um, we 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 pick the better seeds. I mean, to to sow. So it's it's a difficult um, question to answer scientifically without the right equipment. But you you do get a feel for it. And I would definitely say you want a plump seed, dark color, and it must be very firm under your hand. And I think a big part of that is obviously the source, getting it from someone yeah. that you trust. You know, and it's got to be fresher. Um, we, we found that um, we, we find um, we, we're on the end of the European season, so we always get the, the seed that's already six, seven, up to a year old, um, months to a year old. And then we find low germination rates. Then I hold back some seed of my own crop and plant that, and we get 99% germination rate. So the freshness of the seed is, is very important. Um, and the, I think there's some problems in the supply chain at the moment, the way that hemp seed is transported, especially all the way down to the southern hemisphere, mm. um, that we find low-quality seed, which is due to other factors, where the, the, the seed was exposed to other heat, humidity, radiation, or something went wrong on the way here. And we find it with a lot of the seed coming in from the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just, uh, we're, we're running out of time. I just wanted to stay on you, Nati, and just, um, you know, I guess the next question is, you know, in terms of genetics, you know, where to, where to from here? What do we need to still do? Um, Trenton, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really a shotgun approach. I mean, people must come from, from industry side. And I think that will guide our development where, where people come, like we've seen now with companies coming on board with hemp bricks, you'll see that coming on board with cellulose, with, with, um, all these biofuel plants and, and we'll, we'll guide it, um, by the direction where our major markets are going to be, because we don't know yet. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about textiles 
in my opinion, we're years off from a proper textile industry, but there might be some other lower hanging fruit, um, which will guide our development. I see a lot of opportunity in land trace hemp. Um, it, is, it, is, it is something that we just need to get around the definition and move that definition from a plant-based definition to a product-based definition, where we say, listen, once we've tested the fiber and the herd and even the roots um, on this plant, we, we find no detectable levels of, of the cannabinoids in that part of the plant. If we take the flower, we do find some THC levels and split it there on a product level and not on a plant-based level, because that will open up the opportunity to really utilize what's already currently standing in the Eastern Cape in areas where it's become feral. Um, and it really just, just um, uh, seeds itself and it comes up on mass in big areas. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a huge opportunity to just utilize that and then use that genetics. Like I said earlier, we've got these, these very interesting traits where there are long flowering plants and not really responding to daylight as much as you would expect. Um, use those traits and, and identify them and breed them into M varieties. Um, and, and try and get that THC down if it's going to be important in the end. Look, we're looking at about 3% THC anyway. It's not like it's like it's anything that you would buy in a club in South Africa. Mm. Um, there we start at 15% THC. So this falls also, land trace also falls into a very weird space where people would tell you hemp is under 1% or 2% and medicinal cannabis is 12% up. So where we really fit this um, is, is also, I mean, it, there's no space for it. So I really think split it at product level, and 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 then we can we can focus on utilizing these things also genetically. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Nati. Ayanda, where's from here? I know that uh, you know you have your beady eye on seeds and what's coming in from where, and you know how, how are you feeling about the prospects for for this growing season? Um, so I'm feeling maybe a little bit more positive uh, than last year when we obviously were permits were, were issued so late uh, in the season that it was quite a bit of a scramble to try and access seeds. I think there's quite a big um, effort now into at least trying to source a little bit earlier and then trying to, I think Nati was, was, was really um, spot on around the idea that you need to be able to aggregate all of that demand so that you can also compete against other global uh, buyers who are looking to, to, oh. to buy that same seed. Um, so a, li a little bit, a little bit more hopeful. I mean, um, you know, in truth, I, I would say to folks, I mean, don't really be too deterred by the THC limits. I mean, we know these are really arbitrary and where it comes to um, particularly the, the, the non kind of smokable like parts of uh, the cannabis plant, that THC level is negligible anyway. So I think that's likely to um, that's likely to fall away. What I would like to, to see, and I'm, I'm hoping that Garth Strachan might also be um, on the platform, but I think something that's really important as well is around the coordination of all of this R&D and innovation that's linked to what the output markets look like, right? Because mm -hmm. what we find is that actually lots of folks um, across the country are doing very interesting things, but it's not really well coordinated. So there isn't a way of being able to consolidate that kind of competitive advantage, to benefit from different kinds of economies, whether that's of scale or scope. Um, so I, I am a little bit hopeful that that we're pushing in the right direction, but I'm particularly hopeful because I'm seeing folks, um, various farmers across the country who are, um, yes, taking the risk, but also who are looking to test, improve their skills, learn a little bit more. Um, and I think the way that we, we're going to do this is sort of slowly, um, but hopefully with a little bit more aplomb than what we've had previously. Yeah. Right. Thanks for that. Uh, I, so I, like you, am uh, definitely optimistic for this year. I think we just got to get plants on the ground. You know, so we might not know what to do with it afterwards, but we've got to start somewhere. You know, um, uh, Quena, what would your advice be to the the hemp industry at the moment in terms of how you know we can partner with governments and uh, in terms of what you would like to see happen this year? Uh, uh, look, we we, we 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 do understand as, as as ARC the frustration of the farmers or the people of Aruko the permit, but they don't have. Uh, uh, the seed to 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 plant uh, their field, and uh, I know it's, it's it's always risky also to source something that has never been tested in uh, in in your conditions or in your area. You don't know whether the cultivars are going to perform better or they're going to perform worse. So, but that's the risk uh, that our farmers have to take at the moment. Uh, ARC is uh, is always open to to to, to collaborations. 
And uh, as, as mentioned, uh, I, I also had information that it's not only SA1 and SA2 that has been uh, uh, submitted for the registration. There are also other companies that have uh, uh, sent some documents for the registration of the cultivars. And uh, if uh, also they are uh, the farmers here, we've got uh, or we've developed seeds uh, that uh, would like also to be part of the evaluation that we are currently doing. We are welcome to do that. We can have some sort of an agreement and uh, maybe include those cultivars as part of the evaluation that we are currently doing. I, I was also impressed with uh, what I've seen uh, with the, the, the gentleman that we interviewed from, from Argentina. Mm. I think they're doing a great work there. If, if, if possible, uh, maybe you can also share some uh, contacts, his, his contacts. Maybe you can also form some sort of uh, a collaboration with regard to the uh, the, the the seat and, and see how, how how it goes. But I was really impressed with what I've seen in the video. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. I think uh, thank you for that, uh, Quinn. I think you know as I mentioned earlier, this industry is actually bigger than any of us, and it's more important than ever before. Um, the importance of working together at CED. Um, what is the how, how do we get this industry to work together? You know, we have people doing things on their own. We're not the most collaborative in the southern hemisphere of Africa. How do we actually foster and fuel that that spirit of actually working together to make this happen for the benefit of everybody? Mm -hmm. I think dialogue. I think we need more platforms where we can have more discussions around these issues because this, the problems that we see in Malawi, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa, they're more or less the same. Therefore, I do think um, groups such as yourselves, Chiba um, and Friends of Hel and Friends of Hemba are also trying to do the same. So I think it's through those efforts that we can push um, these conversations forward. And with that, I think it's also for better engagement with policymakers and regulators to give them, I mean, I guess, on one hand, you can also only give so much information. Um, it's also for them to also understand what is being conveyed and what the experts um, that have been working with the plant and within the industry um, have experienced and the lessons that they can then for impart. So I think it's also about listening and just and not just talking. And I think it's also to address the stigma as well, because again, the reason why this is so complicated is because of the years of prohibition and the war against drugs. And unfortunately, that's what makes it harder to even, you know, catch the low hanging fruits relating to hemp. So there's no way that we can really advance as a, as a cannabis or as a hemp industry without addressing some of those hurdles. Um, and it's just as it's, it's it's sometimes it's even smaller things such as clarifying certain um, misconceptions around whether or not hemp is covered by the, inter the international treaties or not. So we also just need to communicate those positions better. Um, because then you'll find that a lot of these arguments that appear to be rooted in science um, usually fall away. So that's what I hope for. Great. That's a great way to end. I think uh, I absolutely agree with you. Guys, thank you so much. Um, some very insightful information. We appreciate everybody sharing knowledge and being here. You know, uh, I think that the, the, the THC and the hemp industry, I think, are quite different in terms of their DNA you know, and the kind of people that they attract. You know, uh, hemp is more of a traditional agricultural crop. Cannabis has a whole other sort of matrix that comes with it, you know, THC cannabis. So um, I'm really hoping that we can find some good camaraderie, some good collaboration. And, and as, uh, as you said, you know, sharing platforms and sharing knowledge, that's what it's all about. So if you have people that weren't able to make tonight, please, uh, this recording will be up by tomorrow. We'll send out the link. Um, please share the knowledge uh, and get in touch if you have anything that you'd like to share with us, because that's what this uh, platform is all about. Guys, thank you so much. Um, have a beautiful evening wherever you are, and uh, we will see you soon. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.